Madame Corbeil. Monsieur Rostit. On ne fait pas la 70 à la fin? Non, non. Après, Après les questions. questions. Yeah, that was fast. Good system, I like it. Uh, we'll see now. <laughs> we'll see now <laughs> if it's a good system. Uh, just to clarify before I ask my questions, uh, 4005, or regarding 4005, my past suggestion was uh, for people that don't come to all the meetings, or especially the CCU meetings, that uh, it could be clarified better. So I suggested a few months ago or whenever that, uh, you know, when these projects come up that maybe in brackets or wherever we could put either uh, more clarification on the location, uh, for example, uh, with the project uh, on the agenda tonight, uh, 15905-15915 Boulevard Pierrefonds, brackets we could put at Cote West, the Santa Dachat, Nav Fruit Nevada, or whatever, Some, it's just so people might have a better idea, uh, even though tonight you mentioned it, uh, uh, Cote de... Uh, Akaban. Akaban, exactly. But well, I well, mean, I, in, in, on the agenda, you know, for clarification purposes. Well, the, it's, it's uh, noted, uh, Mr. Stid, as it was the last time. And in fact, uh, certainly we can make a reference to some other uh, landmark uh, or, or business in the area that we can clearly identify it. And like I stated last time, you could also, if you wanted to, include uh, brought up at the CCU such and such date, first reading such and such a date, second reading. Tonight well, I, or think, whatever. I think I think I think the people that follow these files. No, it's not complicated. But I think the people that follow these uh, files and the evolution of these projects are well aware of the locations and when they're presented, as they are public, as you know. Uh, one of not many uh, boroughs and communities that has public consultation meetings, uh, but all of that is well noted, Mr. Stitt. Thank you. Well, just for the people that maybe aren't up on it as much as the others, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, also. Uh, tonight there was, uh, I don't know, three or four items added to the agenda, a point of order. I don't, th and there was also one that was just deleted. Uh, but I don't think this was mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah, it was. Was it? When, when Madame Corbet oh, yeah? reads the agenda, okay. she always, if you're, and you can go back to the Normally, tape and yeah. you'll see it. She reads uh, the agenda, adoption of the agenda, and with she, the changes okay. and additions. And that's, in fact, what she did this evening. Okay, well, then I apologize because I was probably looking at my own notes and questions. Go not, ahead, not go ahead, Mr. Uh, I noticed that uh, it's mentioned tonight uh, resolutions for the Rib Fest and the Strangers in the Night. So this recalls my question also of, uh, probably last fall regarding the idling of police cars. And if there's anything we can do, instead of having four cars or whatever the number, idling their engines, adding to uh, global warming and pollution uh, over uh, three, three full days from actually morning to night uh, in regard to uh, both those, uh, well, three days for the Rib Fest and two days for the Strangers well, in the in Night. In fact, if you remember, Mr. Stitt, I had also made that uh, point and asked that question to the commander. And we were clearly yep. uh, indicated that the cars have to be running for the reasons that he gave on several occasions, even after you asked him as well. And I believe, if I remember, he had said that he would uh, evaluate what can be done in future. However, I haven't heard anything from him. He wasn't here tonight, but uh, it is noted, and I plan to make sure that uh, we address that. The other element that we do, I mean, I know you talk about the global warming and, 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 and the, 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 you know, the, the cars running and polluting and, and all the rest of it. Uh, we also, when we plan our events, uh, you know that we've uh, started to create green initiatives where uh, we try to limit the waste, if not zero waste, for these events and use uh, recycled materials, you know, for the plateware and, and, and utensils and so on. And we make sure that we are very uh, uh, clear in working with uh, third part partner, third partners uh, when they do these events to try to be able to incorporate this in, in their planning. 
uh, and we do our own share as well, but it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't negate the fact that they have cars running at the intersections. It just means that we also have other initiatives as well that we take into consideration when we plan these major events that attract sometimes you know, 30 to 40,000 people in a weekend. So mm -hmm. uh, we're conscious of that. And we also try to promote public transit as well in, in accessing the site to make sure that people don't bring their vehicles if, if they don't need to. You know? And uh, uh, we also try to work with uh, our partners to create some type of shuttle system. I know that the Strangers in the Night uh, group uh, also are in negotiations to try to get a shuttle coming in from Fairview, for, for example. So you don't have a lot of those cars coming into our communities, not only for the pollution, but also wayfinding through the residential areas to find appropriate parking. So this is an ongoing uh, issue, I have to say, and a challenge, I must say. It's not an easy solution, but the police is one that we will bring up. I will bring up personally this week again to see if they've come up with a solution, if, if anything, to reduce the number of cars at these intersections if they have to be running. Well, if the sole reason for them running is to uh, keep the red uh, emergency lights on, I'm sure there's another way around that, you know? Well, that's, I mean, not, what he, that's not what he had said. He had said clearly well, that, that the type of, the of it, that was cited, one of the reasons, yeah. but the other reason was also the, the high-tech equipment that is in these police cars requires a lot of power yeah. that they can't run if the vehicle isn't running or would drain the batteries to the point where the cars wouldn't be able to start if there was an emergency and the car would have to be deployed. This is the answer that he had given us and what he had repeated well, here. Well, that's why I asked him, once the cars are finished for the night or whatever, are they plugged in or charged? And he said, no, they're, they're just left as a regular car. So, well, anyways, because, because they're not running, the the equipment in the car is not running at that point. Well, <laughs> I mean, when the car yeah. is running, the equipment is running, and so it has to be the 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 battery has to keep charging because the equipment is drawing so much power. When the car is off, it's like at your at your home. But he didn't give a breakdown on how I'll much the, the up, light draws versus how much the computer system draws. Yeah, you know, that good, would be an point. interesting statistic good to point. have. I'll, actually, I'll ask him, Mr. Stitt. Okay. Last question. Uh, recently, the trees behind the cultural center, quite a few of them were cut. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, it's because of the ash borer disease, I would assume. But Monsieur, Monsieur Baudouin, Madame Castonguay, les arbres qu'on avait coupés. Just, just let me finish. Avant que il il a fait une réponse. Uh, and regardless of the reason why they're cut, I think I notice on some trees there seems to be a little noticing ash borer or whatever with a a green thing around it or a red, a red line, you know. But I, I would suggest uh, that every tree that gets cut uh, should have uh, something on it uh, and also uh, somewhere where people get more information and also uh, a date of replacement, uh, a replacement plan uh, to reforest uh, these trees or these areas, you know. Well, well, the but, the the I'm not sure what kind of markings you want on the trees, but the trees well, are cut. something where the public would know what's going on and why why is this tree getting cut and when is it well, going to be replaced? Okay, you know? well, yeah. we try we something try to uh, make sure that we treat every tree before it's cut to make sure that it is treatable. It's when it isn't treatable and it needs to be cut that it's cut. We also have, if you know on our website, I believe it's still there, the bullet that identifies clearly the ash borer disease mm -hmm. and, the, and the issues we have not only in our community but throughout Canada for that matter, if not North America. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we clearly indicate the issues that we deal with on a regular basis. You also have to know that we've planted since we've been here, and I can't speak for before, but we've planted thousands of trees on our territory, and this is an ongoing uh, initiative uh, to to rebuild and reinforce our canopy. And uh, I'm not sure about other communities, but I can tell you that we're quite active in the planting of trees and we have other initiatives that will be announced soon that I can't divulge right now that will only increase the number of trees that we will be planting in our, in our community. As to replace the trees, I don't have a number of trees that we've cut per se uh, on our territory regarding the ash uh, borer disease. However, uh, we plant many, many more trees than we cut. Uh, and the information is readily available on the website, Mr. Stid, if, if I'm not mistaken. And, but we'll verify this with our communication department, but I'm pretty sure that it is, if last I checked. I haven't looked for it personally. Well, I, I, think, time, I think, well, respectfully, yeah. Mr. Stid, I think that maybe we need to look at that before we ask a question like that. But, but your point is well made, and I will make sure that we look into it and make sure that we have, uh, we have that information at least up to date for you, for you folks. Right. Uh, 
regarding uh, and regarding the cultural center, was it uh, were those trees cut because they had ash borer disease, Monsieur? The same, same thing, thing? Yeah. all of them. Yeah. Okay. But as you know, that we had proved that la for just to answer this last point and let someone else ask a question, mm. we had uh, also passed a resolution. If you know, if you remember, where it was to rebuild uh, the garden, the Richmond Garden, which actually today you saw the fencing going up. And that is also incorporated to the project that we have that we will be redoing the pathway and the passage from the parking lot here at the, at the, uh, at the uh, Borough Hall going mm -hmm. through the wooded area, linking not only the library but also linking the cultural center and CLSC. And so that is another major project that we're working on. And uh, as Mr. Baudouin said, it wasn't for any other reason but to cut those trees because they were infested. What's wrong with the existing path uh, linking those uh, areas right now? Well, the path that's there right. already will be revitalized. There will oh. be benches. There will be some lights. It will create more of a welcoming sort of environment so people can have easier access from the main parking lot to these areas and not have to park on the other side if there isn't parking. It's to create a passage that's more, uh, uh, I guess, accommodating for all users to, to go that way and access all these facilities. And just a parting comment, uh, as much as we can replace the trees, uh, we know it takes years to get the trees back to the size that they were, uh, obviously, and that's been mentioned in the past by other people. We have to, yeah. thank you, Mr. Stitt. Like and uh, just quickly, uh, the uh, cost of trees, as you know, being what it is and the resources that communities have, mm -hmm. uh, we have to really uh, be careful in terms of how we prioritize the caliber of trees that we plant throughout the territory. Yeah. And of course, if it is an important area that needs to be uh, uh, revitalized quickly, then certainly we look at higher caliber trees. Uh, but if there are areas that we can plant abundantly and, and not worry necessarily about the size of the tree, then we will continue to do that. And certainly within a number of years, as we've seen throughout the territory, they'll grow and they'll be mature enough before no time at all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Stitt. Mr. Laurent Chouinard. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Alors, premièrement, évidemment, je dois vous remercier à vous, maire, conseiller et tous les membres de l'équipe de la Ville et tous les bénévoles qui ont travaillé d'arrache-pied pour nous aider à protéger notre rue. La 5e Avenue a été épargnée cette année et c'est sans doute grâce à l'effort de tout le monde. On est extrêmement reconnaissant à cet égard. Et particulièrement, Mme Louise Leroux, qui nous a grandement aidé à être un point de contact formidable pendant toute l'expérience. Merci particulier à vous. Je voulais maintenant savoir, considérant que ça va être extrêmement difficile de négocier avec REM, Étant donné le projet en cours et les difficultés d'obtenir de, de l'information du REM, qui est un projet un peu hermétique, et que les travaux n'auront pas lieu avant deux ans pour notre secteur environ, euh, je voudrais savoir qu'est-ce que vous avez l'intention de faire ou mettre en place pour qu'on n'ait pas à se demander à chaque année si, oui ou non, ils vont nous gracieusement permettre d'avoir l'autorisation d'avoir une, une digue temporaire construite, étant donné que ça a été quand même difficile d'avoir l'autorisation euh, pour le faire cette année. Je ne veux pas qu'à chaque année, on se redemande est-ce qu'on va ou non avoir l'autorisation cette année, puis se croiser les doigts. Je vous que dis, le monsieur merci, va dire oui. Merci d'attendre à la fin pour poser la question. Je vous dis honnêtement, le temps qu'on est là, comme administration, la digue va rester là. On va faire le plus possible, puis on va poser la digue comme c'était cette année. Entre-temps, j'ai déjà communiqué, comme je ne sais pas si euh, j'avais dit quand j'étais sur le terrain, euh, on sait très bien que le REM euh, va arriver puis va être monté, je pense, 5, 5 mètres d'eau dans ce secteur. J'ai déjà demandé plusieurs fois, encore la semaine dernière, à une rencontre que j'étais avec Mme Castonguay, avec les responsables, maintenant avec la Ville de Montréal, et j'ai dit, on a une opportunité maintenant de construire un digue en permanence en dessous. Et là, le message était transmis encore pour une deuxième ou troisième fois, je crois. Et encore, je vais poser la même question à la réunion cette semaine avec les responsables du REM. Nous, on va faire le plus possible pour s'assurer qu'on a une digue à cet endroit-là. Entre-temps, oui, le temporaire est nécessaire et sans faute, on va le faire comme on a fait cette année. Et je ne sais pas si c'est quelque chose qu'on peut garder là pour le moment, pour l'enlever, juste pour l'enlever, pour moi, ça ne fait pas de sens. On va essayer de le garder là, euh, mais même s'il faut l'enlever, euh, on va le remettre l'année prochaine. Ça, je vous assure, on va faire le plus possible ici comme arrondissement et comme administration de, de s'assurer qu'on a la digue là, même en, en temporaire. 
Mais comme j'ai dit, entre-temps, on travaille avec les responsables pour s'assurer qu'on a une digue euh, permanente euh, en dessous euh, éventuellement. D'accord. Merci. Merci. Deuxième question, je voulais savoir si vous étiez au courant que les euh, égouts pluviaux du building à l'arrière euh, sur Megan, Place Gouin, oui. euh, ont été extrêmement hauts pendant les épisodes. On les a vus à quelques centimètres de déborder. Oui. On se doute que ce serait probablement un bon endroit pour aller installer des ballons, comme il a été fait ailleurs. Euh, Peut-être ajouter ça sur les plans euh, d'intervention. Effectivement, c'est noté. Euh, on sait très bien. Euh, on est en train maintenant de, de continuer avec le, le, le ramassage des sacs un peu partout. Mais en même temps, on est en train d'analyser la situation partout dans le secteur. On sait très bien, ce n'est pas juste sur Megan. On a d'autres endroits où on avait la même situation à peu près. Euh, une chose est sûre que dans ces endroits-là, on a les stations de pompage qui nous aident beaucoup. Ailleurs, on n'a pas de station de pompage et là, ça nous cause plus de problèmes. Et c'est pour ça qu'on a mis des, euh, des bâtards d'eau un peu partout mm -hmm. sur le territoire pour régler la situation. Maintenant, ça, c'est des gestes temporaires quand même. Et là, c'est pour cette raison qu'on travaille pas juste avec l'arrondissement, mais on travaille avec Montréal aussi pour trouver des solutions à ces endroits-là. Mais c'est sûr que cet endroit est bien noté. Parfait. Merci. Merci encore pour Merci. tous vos efforts. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir. Madame Holly Arsenault. Mayor and Council. Good evening. Good evening. Once again, uh, representing our street, we would like to thank you for all your efforts because we are still dry and we are still above or and or below water, whichever level you're looking at. Um, okay, when this all started <laughs> back in April, um, we had a little bit of problem trying to get organized on our street. And I just wanted to maybe make a suggestion that could have helped at the time. Um, we needed someone who could have organized for us, a foreman or somebody who knew the history of the street with regards to the pumps and the dikes and the um, flood history of what had happened like in 2017 because we have very capable people on our street to do things, but we didn't know where to start. We had conflicting stories of people coming, the city workers coming to say, we're going to do this and then we're going to do this second and what can the people do and we didn't know and they didn't know and then another city worker would tell us something different and we were very anxious and we were very capable and we were very ready to do something to get it started and we just needed somebody to direct us. Well noted. Okay. Now I know that you know that we delivered bags to every resident there. Yeah. You know that uh, we did a lot of proactive uh, communication in terms of what to do with those bags, how to block up your homes, which is understandably the responsibility of the homeowner, right? Correct. I agree with that. The, the additional uh, element that we brought in uh, um, more than we had done ever before was we had brought in piles of sand for the residents to mm -hmm. coordinate, and this is where later on the volunteer effort came in to make sure that they tried to help in the best way they could. The dike behind Fifth Avenue North, as you know, we had built the one on the train track and we're monitoring closely the one, the water that was seeping through the bike path, which if you remember, hadn't by your home there, it hadn't crested past the bike path. It had reached almost that level, but it hadn't come over. And this is why when the action is prioritized throughout the territory, the decisions that are made through the operations and through civil security is to make sure that they prioritize their action in where the areas are the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And this is what was being done. If there was issues that you were dealing with that maybe, uh, as you say, there weren't proper directives or at the right time in your area, It's clearly noted, and we'll make sure that uh, if that's the case, then we'll make sure that we address that in our own way internally and see that it doesn't happen in the future. I know that we made major improvements in that area this yeah, yeah. year, uh, but if there were some areas that needed fine-tuning, well, by all means, we're going to make sure mm -hmm. that we work on that. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, we had lots of, lots of volunteers and lots of 
people on the street ready to do something. The individual houses we had sort of figured out on our own. It was the, the dike, the one near the train tracks, the one through the woods, yeah. the ones over near the bridge, we, and uh, on the side of uh, Megan, like yeah. uh, Laurent. If I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, the water didn't crest at all in any of those areas. No, you're right. No, I know that, and I knew this. It was and, close. And, no, so but Jim. no, but I knew this, and and we yeah. know that even in 2017, it never crested there. Right. Uh, and that was thanks to the dikes that were built in the 70s in that area, uh, in the mm -hmm. 80s, actually. What am I saying? In the 80s. Right before I had started in Roxborough. So 70, it was right after the floods of 76. 76, yeah. That's after right. 76, And right. so uh, you're right. And we knew that it hadn't crested in that area. And so the responsibility of the teams with civil security were, and we had it requested that they made sure that they verified the strength of the dike that was there so we wouldn't find ourselves in the same situation as St. marceau le lac And this is why, if you remember, the army came at one point to figure out two areas, not near you, the, a little bit right of you from the back. Mm -hmm. There were two vulnerable spots or relatively weak spots that they mm -hmm. had to reinforce. But aside from that, it didn't crest there. It didn't crest at Megan, even though it was high. It didn't go over there. These were all preventative measures that were yeah. done yeah. in case. Okay. I, but, but sorry. I agree with all that. But sorry, just to finish up on that. <laughs> The other step that we're going to be looking at is to make sure, in fact, that that dike is uh, secure. Mm. And this is an ongoing thing that we'll be doing this year to make sure that if it has to be reinforced, uh, that we do something to reinforce it. The other benefit we have about that dike is, so people know, is that it's a mature dike that has a lot of trees and shrubbery mm -hmm. and root systems going through all of this area, which seems to have solidified that dike. And it's not just loose soil as we see in some other areas. So uh, it, it worked again. And mm -hmm. so we're going to make sure that it's secure and, and as we move forward, take the necessary action. But it's well okay. noted, Mrs. Arsenault. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, what you mentioned, my property, uh, my property was wet up until yesterday. Like about a third of the backyard was still underwater. But not from the water cresting. Not from, from the, the cresting. water table. It's from it seeping from the water through table. and a different spot than yep. last than previous to this. Yep. We're worried that the inside section has been compromised by the 2017 water that came up yep. and actually sat up against it for that week. Well, th this is what I'm this telling is, you. This is what we're worried about yeah. because I, I mean, if my if if my piece of property loses its strength, the yeah. whole the this the street will go under even if that little dike is is nice and snug up against the bi the the bicycle path and the the, the train station. You're 100 percent right. Train railway. And that, and that's there. why I said to you is that yeah. our role right now is to make sure uh, how strong that dike is, okay. and to make sure that there is if there is an area that's compromised that we take the necessary action to yeah. make sure that we reinforce it. Okay. And this can be done with engineers and experts that are going to come on site and and guide us accordingly. I don't think it's anything that we necessarily want the expertise in doing I mean we need to make sure that people tell us exactly how it has to get reinforced if you will instead of just putting bags all the time and so that's something we're going to look at okay and are we are we looking at this year be between we've now already and started we've already started looking okay. at all the areas and, and how are how are we as the residents of that street going to be notified my, my goal is my goal is uh, as we move forward um, to go sector by sector and uh, have public meetings with okay. the residents that live in these areas. In the west, uh, there's a pocket of, of streets that uh, are quite vulnerable and would have been underwater if it wasn't for the initiatives that we took. Uh, the walls that we built snaking through all the residential properties literally was a work, and I have to mm -hmm. say it was a, an engineering work of art. I have to tell you, even though yeah. uh, it didn't look pretty in many cases, it, it worked, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but what I want to do, what I'd like to do is eventually, as we move forward, have meetings with the folks that live in these areas. For example, yes. I may call a meeting like with Fifth year. Avenue North yeah. and just have a brainstorming, even here, a brainstorming meeting, all of us, talk about what we did this year, what worked, what didn't, and the plans that we have, not only as a borough, but as a government with the provincial government to try to put some permanent infrastructure in there and reinforce it to make you feel at ease. 
it's not a perfect science, I have to say. I mean, mm -hmm. Mother Nature being what it is, I mean, we could do whatever we want. If Mother Nature wants, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it, it's gonna to do what it did at St. Marc sur lac But we yeah. need to involve the residents that live in these areas because some of you have been there through all the floods. Mm -hmm. And so you know what's worked in the past and hasn't. And you, like you mentioned with your home now, I'm not sure if even we knew that, that it had seeped in some, through some of the root systems in, in that dike. Yeah. And so that, that needs to be evaluated for sure. But that's, that's going to be to come, okay? I'm hoping to be able to do that uh, sometime in August. We're going to start calling meetings for that because we're still in the cleanup phase. You have to oh, understand. Sure. And so once we get through this, in August, we'll try to coordinate some meetings with the different areas and have folks involved in finding solutions here sort of longer term. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, all that good? We're good with that. And just to let you know, today was the first day we could walk across the bridge to go back over to the island. That's amazing. It's dried that much. So. I, I, I'm there more often than you think, by the way. Oh, well. I, yeah. yeah, you may not see me where you're <laughs> living at the end of the street, but I'm there more than you think because I'm, I have to tell you, we all are. Uh, as concerned and as worried and as anxious as all of you are as well because not only are yeah. we trying to protect you and do everything that we can but we're also concerned for all of you too and so uh, this is why we're always on the ground and our services and our staff are there and you know how they've been available mm -hmm. uh, but you guys on Fifth Avenue North I say it like the other areas were remarkable in your community effort because you were you were so united as a as a street and what you were able mm -hmm. to do that it was phenomenal the dikes in the back of your homes a lot of it is you're doing all the volunteers that got together and did it uh, and uh, that's just phenomenal work uh, and having said that uh, mm -hmm. there are two areas that are going to be left for nearly the end of the cleanup in terms of when we will go and pick up all those bags behind your properties and you're one of them because of the number of bags that are there and the resources that are required to move them. And right. so that's being evaluated as we speak, really. We talked about it this afternoon. I don't have a timeline for you, but uh, we'll let you know when that happens, okay? Great. Thank you, Holly. Thanks. Monsieur Marc Chernin. Bonsoir, Monsieur le maire, Bonsoir. Euh, membre du conseil, merci. Bonsoir. Euh, mon nom, c'est Mark Chernin. Je suis un résident de la rue Lauzon, à Pierrefond, un des secteurs, euh, comme on sait, euh, qui était particulièrement frappé par euh, les inondations de il y a à peu près un mois. <coughs> Ce soir, je suis ici aussi avec euh, 14 ou 15 de mes voisins de la rue Lauzon. Et euh, eux autres aussi, bien sûr, ils ont vécu les mêmes difficultés que nous autres, euh, ma famille, euh, uh, a vécu. Um, we, we know that the number one responsibility of city officials is to protect the safety and security of its residents. That maybe uh, goes without saying. And there's no question that in 2019, the city did a much better job than in 2017, getting us organized, informing us, helping us during the flood, and I signal your effort in particular, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Langevin. Uh, you were there uh, at our house, in the lines, helping with the sandbags, and I know you helped many of our neighbors and we all deeply appreciate it. Um, but that being said, uh, all that work that the city does comes at a tremendous cost, um, financially. Uh, what we do as residents of, of uh, Lauzon, having been hit hard in 2017 and 2019, comes at a significant cost as well, in terms of our time, our effort, the psychological stress that dealing with the flooding brings. And so my question is, and you may have partially answered it, I think, in responding to other speakers here tonight. In the longer term, what does the city intend to do um, to fulfill its number one mandate to protect the safety and security of the residents, not only of Lauzon, but Rue uh, Angers, Boulevard, Gouin West, where approximately 25 families um, that are affected and have been uh, twice over the last three years. So what is the longer term vision in terms of attempting to protect the safety and security? Uh, you've mentioned dikes that have been built in certain areas uh, of Pierrefonds that seem to have worked. Is that, for example, a feasible alternative for uh, the area in which we live, and if not, are there other plans that are being contemplated? 
Thank you for the question. And uh, in fact, we did see each other uh, on the ground on several occasions. And so uh, my, my, uh, my heart goes out to all of you who uh, unfortunately had to deal with this situation again. Uh, being a difficult area uh, to manage and to secure with even temporary dikes, uh, we were faced with the same predicament virtually that we had in 2017, despite the efforts and the countless, uh, many tens if not hundreds of thousands of bags and volunteers that came by and staff and all the rest of it. Um, having said that, uh, I still, as I mentioned to you on the ground that time, uh, there, there are several issues here. One is we need to clearly identify the flood map in that area. We kind of know it, but I need to see it, the new one. Um, as I mentioned earlier to somebody, do we really want to build walls around communities? I don't know if that's necessarily the answer. Uh, and this is why experts will be involved at some point to be able to guide us, especially in your area, being where it is, what are some of the solutions? Quickly off the top of my head, it's to build a natural dike around the area, three area, three corners, you know, you're, you're with each side except on Gouin. On Gouin, you can put something temporary, but the other areas, in my mind, seem pretty easy to be able to build a dike all around, right? I don't know how feasible that would be, and I don't know if we will be permitted to do that. Our goal is to make sure that we recommend and we push for what is necessary in your area. And if we believe with you, once we call our meeting and we'll meet in here with your street in that area, which I said to the other folks, then together, collectively, we can ask for these things. And make sure that someone is listening when we say that, look, if we were to do this, and if experts help us assess the situation of what happened, and we know that we can build a dike on the three sides, for example, that will integrate well in the landscape, that won't have any environmental impact on the community there, except protect it, won't affect the wildlife or any of the shrubbery or the native plants that are in the wetlands or along the stream in the back, for example, because you need experts to tell us that, mm. well then, by all means, we should do everything and anything we can to be able to do that. Now, that doesn't stop the water from coming up from the water table, being a vulnerable zone like where you are. It could happen. It probably will happen. But at least the damages could and probably would be minimized. And that's our goal as we move forward, because as we are still in the cleanup stage, we still plan and we still are analyzing these, these situations here. To do the sandbagging thing every even three, five years, I'm telling you, realistically, hmm. it's, it's, it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible, realistically, to be able to deploy though that, forget about the money, the manpower, the material, the psychological impact that not only to the homeowners, to the staff, to us, to the volunteers, is absolutely enormous. So if we want to be realistic about it, we need to think about more permanent solutions. Absolutely. And those more permanent solutions come with a collective effort from a community that's going to pitch something. And I will make sure I have the provincial representatives here with us. They will listen to us. They will be our voice like they came on site when I brought them and make sure that they understand clearly what that is there. And I don't want to hear from the government, take 200 grand and leave, because that's not what I'm going to hear. And chances are that the folks that are living there that have been there for decades and generations possibly mm -hmm. don't want to hear that either. That's for sure. And our role is to try to find a solution to try to make you stay there. And if there is a solution, let's do it and move on. And so that's what we're going to do as we meet here collectively. Know that we're on your side and we will do whatever we can. And I'm not telling you this in a political capacity. I'm telling you this in a community that's been there longer than I have that needs to be preserved now. We have to take everything into consideration and do whatever we can, but we will do it together. And this is when we meet in August, we will make sure we create a critical path and an action plan to be able to voice our opinion at these government levels, I promise you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank That's you. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank, Thank you. you. Madame Chantal Jacques. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, councillors. 
I also want to thank you all. Um, being from Lausanne Street, being the last house that got flooded first, uh, thank you very much for your presence on the ground, um, especially um, to the mayor, Monsieur Langevin, Madame Talbot, Clément Talbot aussi, uh, qui a été très disponible toujours pour nous. Um, I want to bring up a subject uh, that is from the 2017 flood, actually. It's a matter that I've brought up before uh, with Madame Talbot, uh, Clément Talbot as well. It is uh, the problem we have with the homes that were demolished on Lausanne Street following the 2017 floods. Um, there were two homes that were demolished then. There's two homes that have been abandoned since then. There's a home that will probably be demolished as well because of the floods this year. Those properties are an eyesore. Um, they're a place where people can dump things, where trucks can drive and leave a mess. Um, they're not maintained, they're not, the, the grass isn't cut. There's ragweed growing there. Um, now I can call 311 and, and make a complaint to the city every time, but that is not a plan for a long term for a community that wants to see an interesting environment around it, especially when we're, we're looking at so many lots that are empty and abandoned. Um, I'd like to know what the city plans to do regarding these vacant lots. We're not alone with these vacant lots. We have... You, oh, I'm yeah, okay, go answer. ahead. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, we had about 12 vacant lots or so, I would say, since 2017. Some of them, a couple of them are in your area. There are others that uh, are somehow within really heavily residential areas. We know that since those homes sit on the 20-year floodplain, there's nothing we can do on them. We can't even make a green space or a park. There's been a change in government, and we will continue to try to see if there's anything that we can do, whether it's planting, whether it's building of or extending of dikes that we have, particularly in the western portion where we physically had to erect a temporary dike with thousands of bags that were connected to a natural dike on our property that if we had authorization we could just continue this natural dike within the properties that were demolished for example and solve us a huge you know effort if ever it happened again our role is and it's not an easy one i have to tell you is that because it sits on the 20-year floodplain we can't do anything on it we can't plant, we can't cut, it has to stay in its natural state. And what I voiced my opinion with the government when I went to a couple of these meetings is, that's fine when it's sitting in the bush somewhere, but these properties sit in the middle of a residential area where people will dump, you know, teenagers will congregate, uh, it'll become an eyesore and a nuisance, it'll, you know, bring, uh, you know, all the you know, little whatever, I was going to say, uh, skunks and all sorts of things that will live in these areas which would probably be fine if they were in a secluded area but they sit really in the middle of a residential area so the long-term solution is to be able to not only use those to create some type of barrier but also to get authorization to be able to at least in a minimal way maintain them we don't have the resources necessarily to be able to deploy teams or resources to put grass and cut and all that kind of stuff because we have, you know, over 75 parks and green spaces and we just have enough resources for those. You can imagine now if we made those into green spaces. Uh, there have been some requests from uh, neighboring residents that want to purchase that land, for example, and make it a part of their property. So we're looking to that as well. But that's not an easy solution, I have to tell you, but it's something that's concerning us as well and we constantly bring up to the government. And when we do have the representatives here, when we all meet together, that's another issue that we're going to bring to their attention to make sure that they hear us and they understand what we're talking about. And if they have to, they have to come on site. And we have contacts within the government that hopefully some of the ministers, if not one minister, can come and at least attend some of these meetings and hear from yourselves what, what the issues are locally, okay? What's the issue with planting trees or sowing grass You're not or allowed. sowing They won't let us do anything. Flowers? The decree is very strict in terms of what you can do on a 20-year floodplain, and as it is now, uh, we're not able to do anything. And so, you know what I find fascinating? 
<laughs> and I'm saying this and I'm laughing, I'm sorry, but we're allowed to go in and demolish a home. We're allowed to go mm -hmm. dig out and excavate a foundation, but I can't plant grass. How does that make sense? It doesn't. Exactly. And so those are issues that we're going to be bringing up because you're allowing me or a contractor to go in with a bulldozer and dig this place up to take out a foundation that's been there for 70 years, 100 years in some cases, yeah. but I and can't go in and plant a tree. And leave a mud pile behind. No, exactly. And so yeah. those are issues that we, we, are, we are aware of and are frustrating on our end as well. Mm -hmm. But we will definitely be talking about that when we all get together. But rest assured, if not earlier, uh, in August, we will be planning these meetings with, uh, with the residents individually by sector so that we don't have too many people talking about different things, okay? And your area is one particularly that will be alone, okay? okay thank you. Thank you. Madame Soustaco. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Stacco. Um, I'll try to make it fast so we can all go home. Um, thank you for extending the question period. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my notes. I thought I had longer. Um, uh, I have a couple of points. Um, okay, I'll try. I'll start with the first. Um, in the past, in our 2017 uh, OCPM uh, consultation on Pierrefonds West, yep. um, uh, before before we had those consultations, um, you know, we, we would come often and talk with you, and you would say you said that whatever um, when we would have those consultations, whatever the recommendations that came out of the report, you would uh, honor those recommendations or, or follow them and, and adhere to them. Um, and uh, here we are, um, long after. Um, the recommendations were to continue working on the plan and include all stakeholders in the process, concili conciliate all the data about the biodiversity in the area, um, get updated flood zone maps, traffic studies, and a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so my question is, what progress has been made toward uh, that process? When there was a ch thank you for the question, Mrs. Stacco. For uh, the longest time, as you know, you've asked different questions regarding uh, Pierrefonds West and the OCPM, and uh, it was at our request, actually, that we held the OCPM mm -hmm. uh, hearings to make sure that we make sure that if there ever was a development there that it would be done right. As you know, we've always believed and we still believe that if there ever is a development there, it can be done properly, respecting uh, the, the, not only the, uh, the uh, environmental issues that, that many bring up, including yourself. Uh, but having said that, with the change of administration in Montreal, uh, all discussions regarding Pierrefonds West were off the table. Uh, the concept of preserving all that land uh, apparently uh, was being discussed at the Montreal administration level, which we aren't a part of. Uh, we also had said that nothing can continue in that area until such time, we passed resolutions here, as you know, uh, until such time that there was ever an urban boulevard. Uh, and that was off the table by the administration in Montreal. So for us to devote resources and time um, related to any eventual development of that area uh, would be pointless because we needed or we would need Montreal's approval. And that's something that you know clearly this administration in Montreal has no desire following through with. So those studies were initially supposed to be taken care of by Montreal and the services in Montreal, Les Grands Parcs, among others. And they are the ones that you should be asking if they are following through with any of these initiatives because the OCPM, yes, was a local initiative, but it concerned a sector or parcel of land that had Montreal's jurisdiction as well. And so I think that if you have intention of attending any future Montreal meetings, mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Mr. Fernandez is no longer uh, with them, and I'm not sure really who will take over that file, uh, but I think that question should be asked to them. And as far as we're concerned, uh, there are many issues for us. I mean, uh, certainly we can't work on a file w where we know that once it reaches that level, we'll be completely you know, uh, rejected. Uh, so we have other priorities that we're working on uh, here and unfortunately, uh, and maybe fortunately for others, uh, that's one that unfortunately we can't work on because we know the end result will be what it will be with Montreal. Okay, well, 
I'm, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> um, another point I'd like to make is, you know, uh, mostly the numbers that came up tonight and when you're talking about the provincial government legislating uh, uh, rules on uh, flood zones or, river or uh, waterfront uh, areas, we talk a lot about the 20-year flood zone, but um, those floods, as we know now, are not 20-year uh, uh, flood uh, flooding happenings. Those are within the 100-year um, uh, time frame. And so I hope that uh, with with all that we've all been through, especially uh, you, you guys and, and the, the, the homes that have been flooded, um, will consider um, not only looking at the 20-year flood zone, but looking further to other ways we can mitigate these, such as protecting large natural areas as sponges, which we know they act as, and the studies prove that, and protecting wetlands. And so I hope that that's part of the discussion too. I appreciate that all the effort and uh, attention needs to go to the homeowners, but I hope that when environmental experts are present, that somebody uh, present those issues, and that, or that you invite the public that we can uh, present those issues so that we can also cover that part of the uh, and I and I appreciate process. I appreciate that, uh, Mrs. Stacco, and I, I know that we're we're far from that. To be honest with you, I think uh, the first priority for us is to get uh, people uh, back to normal, yeah, and then uh, find uh, solutions uh, or temporary solutions, if you will, for those sectors. That's number two, and number three is we'll see where we go as we move forward, knowing that technology exists. Uh, to be able to build uh, within 100-year uh, floodplains, 20 to 100-year floodplains. Uh, is that what we want? I'm not sure. I is, not. Uh, well, <laughs> well, well, wait a second, because, you know, in 2017, if we're realistic about it, we hit in areas of Quebec 370-year floodplains. And we know this. And so does that mean that every time we hit a 370-year floodplain, we're not going to build anything or allow anybody to do anything on a 370-year floodplain? And so we need to be very careful here. And that's why I said there's a series of steps we need to take. And for us, the first step is to make sure that our community is safe. After that, if there are discussions to be had with the government, stakeholders, homeowners, and so on, environmentalists, associations, and so on, certainly I think that would be something that would be absolutely required. Like I said at the OCPM, and you remember this well, it was absolutely necessary to make sure that everyone had a voice. And you can be sure that this time around, if we do something like that, then everyone again will have a voice. Or and, Mother and Nature will speak again. Yeah. Well, y yeah. We can't fight. We can't fight it. But we can work with what we have now and work, and work better. But what's left, natural, that's what we need to well, be looking the, at. Well, the natural too. stuff that I told you, and I mentioned earlier to someone uh, tonight, uh, we have for years since we've been here, uh, have worked not, because we don't divulge it doesn't mean that it's not going on because we're negotiating right and when we negotiate for parcels of land we do it to preserve green space and natural space Good. and right you know there. this because we have made announcements in the last number of years where we've been able to acquire land and that's been our initiative that thankfully Montreal has not for all cases, because there's others that they've refused. I'm not going to say, but there are others that they've refused. But there are some that fortunately we were able to acquire, which is benefiting our community and, and the environment. And this is what we will continue to do. And if parcels of land, other than the ones that we have already looked at, need to be uh, examined, then we will make sure that we do that as well. Rest assured. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Stackle. Right. Mr. Jean-Pierre Guindon. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hi. Thank you for waiting till the end, sir. <laughs> it's all right. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for their efforts. We've got a, a ton of people on Lozon Street that are here today. Uh, they've really pulled together and, uh, you know, just made magic happen. Um, little damage, if, if any, but lots and lots of efforts. And uh, I remember seeing you picking up bags and... <laughs> well, it wasn't, we, uh, it wasn't was for show. running down there. It wasn't for show. More. I know, yeah. I know. Um, a lot of the, the questions that I did have have been answered in one way or, or another. Um, I've noticed a significant increase in the way that uh, the efficiency was done. And if it was to happen again, do we have better plans that are laid out already? We, we, what we do have is we created an intervention plan uh, which helped us. We don't talk about it often, but what helped us 
drastically was that we had created after the 2017 flood an intervention plan that created a level of reaction and proactivity that was well below what Montreal even declares their state of emergency. And so we were, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Baudouin, seven to 10 days before even Montreal had declared the intervention plan in place. So, and we knew of this. And so our levels were much lower than what was anticipated in Montreal and through the provincial government. So that was one step. What we need to do this time is take that plan and what we're doing already actually, is that plan that we have where we've identified different addresses, for example, that were impacted heavily in 2017, we've added and we, were, we will be adding to it from the 2019 levels. Even though we weren't flooded in a lot of areas, in most of the areas like we were in 2017, we know of the homes that could have been or homes that will, were salvaged with the actions that we took on the ground. So all that will be documented and make sure as we move forward, not only, as I mentioned earlier, looking at more permanent solutions, but what are some of the temporary things that we're going to do? What is the equipment that we're going to buy that's going to replace the hundreds of thousands of bags like we did in 2017 where we bought modular walls, water gate systems, deflectors, and so many other things that we did, uh, uh, you know, an analysis across North America, really, what was happening. And we continue to do this. Now we know better how to prevent it. Now it's how do we replace some of those initiatives with more permanent infrastructure, mm -hmm. again, with the help of all the stakeholders. And that's not an easy one. It's going to take some time, but we're on it now. We, we were on it while we were in the crisis. Um, the, um, the, the other question that, that I do have is, you know, we are a pocket of homes and still a big, large mass of land. And let's face it, if we're going to put a dike along that river on that side and then in the back and wrap it around. I mean, we're, we're what, like 12, 15 homes in, on, I'm saying, I'm talking on Lozon Street, uh, yep. not talking about the people yep. that are on Gouin, yep. um, which need protection as well. But um, that being said, I know that, you know, I'm gonna ask the hard question, is there, is there talk about expropriation of this sector? Not at all. Okay. Absolutely not at all. Not on our end anyways. Okay. And I haven't heard any echoes, and I'm connected to all those levels, and I haven't heard anything. The only thing I've heard, and you've heard it too, and I mentioned earlier, is that people can leave for 200 grand. Hmm. That's what I've heard. And what I'm saying is I haven't heard any, any talk of expropriation. Okay. If that's to happen there, you can imagine that it will happen for 10 other thousand homeowners across Quebec because they were more than 10,000 deep. Uh, this time around and not 5,500 like they were in 2017. There are over 10,000 homes that were flooded this, this time around. Yeah. So our role is to find solutions, temporary albeit, and propose them. If there is a higher entity that is to impose something, so be it, and then we see what we're going to do collectively as a community. I certainly want to, don't want to be the one, and I will not be the one to ever recommend expropriation for any of these homes because I don't think it's fair to the people that live there, and it's not fair to my community either. Our role is to do everything that we can up until such time that we can't. Even during the floods, when they were waterlogged, we still deployed as much effort as we could because our primary role is to try to provide the necessary service. It's not to abandon them and tell them to leave. Yeah. regardless of the situation. That has to come from the collective discussion that I believe will happen at some point, and we're not there yet. I don't believe we're there yet, and, and I haven't heard any echo of that. And, and if I do, I promise you that if I do, that's when I will call you immediately to a meeting and I will discuss this as a community before we even meet with the government so that we know what we will do as a community before and allow you to be able to voice your concerns at that moment. Good. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Alors, ça met fin à la période de questions. Ça nous amène à 70-01. Oh, sorry, I thought you had given your place, but you switched your place. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mrs. Bond. Sorry. Sorry about that. My two questions were dealing with the uh, adopted, you know, what is it? 
Special Construction 001 and 002. Where, where, where are you, Mrs. Bond? 40.04. Yeah. 40.03 and 40.04, yes. page three. Yes. Concerning What's the timeline of the adoption of these special construction projects 001 and 002, did the city council or anyone else plan that both applications were due on the same day? Madame Corbet? I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I understood the question. You mean that they were following the same schedule? Timeline and schedule, right. Well, it's not the first time that it happens. So this was planned? It wasn't planned, it was... Coincidence. I mean, the, the councillors were working, I mean, promoters came with projects, and the councillors, the, the department, the division So you would working. delay one well, let her so that Mrs. they Bond, go at Mrs. the Bond, same Bond, time? Mrs. Bond, let her answer, please, and then you can ask your other question. No, actually, they, they came, I mean, the projects were submitted to the CCU more or less, maybe not at the same time, but eventually the two uh, councillors, Mr. Massey and Mr. Uh, Debord, they were working each on the project, and it so happened that they were more or less ready at the same time, so the project followed the same calendar. So it, it happens sometimes that one project will be at the first project, the other one will be at second project, but sometimes they are together. And uh, it, was never, it was never an issue. I mean, the public consultation, they were the CCU together, they were, um, the public consultations were held on the same day. We st even started a bit earlier to give more time for each consultation to make sure that people will have a chance to ask questions, so we started at 6 instead of 6.30 p.m. What's your concern, Mrs. So Bond? So I, I, maybe I don't understand your question, but I don't really see a, an issue because it's not the first and maybe not the last time that it happens. Well, the procedure is very complicated. It's very time-consuming for the residents to be informed. They're not informed, they were not informed by a letter. Some people got letters. Most people did not get a letter. It was in the middle of the winter. So really, it is orchestrated by the administration so that two projects come through, are, and they're complicated, involved projects. They don't get their own uh, public information session, which is what it really is. It's not so a are consultation. You purposely, are you saying that we so purposely you should planned try, this? Mrs. Bond, are you yeah. saying that we purposely planned this? Are I you think saying? that you had an in, input. And, you, and you're actually saying Madame that we purposely Cal planned to have a public consultation for two, two projects together. at the same time? Two together. That's yeah. what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's your well, second question, ma'am? And this isn't the first time, as, as Madame Corbet what, what's, has mentioned. What's your it. second question, ma'am? What's your second question, ma'am? That was, it's not the case, but what's your second question? Okay. That's the answer for the first one. Please explain how it is fair that the residents near the five-story condo project on Gwang and 4th Avenue South, adjacent to the train station, which is one of those con special constructions, were so discouraged by the high number needed in the registration to succeed that they did not bother to submit an application. You're saying that, Mrs. Bond. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. No. We never had. It, the procedure no, but you're creates saying, sorry, a number my that is so high that it's impossible to get that number. But what you're saying, what and you said, Mrs. Bond? And it discouraged the residents from opening a uh, application. I, I, I don't know that. You're, respectfully, you're I'm saying that. I'm going to tell that. you that. No, That's but you're saying that the residents were discouraged because mm -hmm. we required a certain number, mm -hmm. but we also have to... We have to also respect the law that governs these types of projects and decisions and know that because of where it sits, the zone requires a certain number of people to be able to oppose a project like this. I don't make that up. We don't make it up. The zone tells you what the number of signatures and number of people required to come, come and sign a register. So I'm not sure where you're getting with this. Well, it is true. However, we had and I'll make it brief, but it is very important. We had a new zoning bylaw drafted in 2010. Okay. And, and during the process, and you were a counselor at the time, and you voted for it, uh, along with Madame Talbot, the other counselors were not on. And the, I would have voted for it again, okay. Um, one of the objections, or uh, one of the main changes was a consolidation of small zones into much larger zones, 
which creates the need of 13 plus 10 percent of the voter and the number skyrockets. And so it became less impossible, really, to block zoning changes, okay, except in certain situations where you had smaller zones. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Mrs. Bond, and I can, judging from the questioning, I suspect that you're opposed to this project. And, and a lot of people and were. And we as an administration, the, were, we have Because of the reasons we brought up at the meeting, a couple of the residents who were able to go, as well as I brought up and some other people brought up, and those changes aren't being made. Well, to end tonight, Mrs. Bond, uh, I just want to tell you that as we mentioned to you at the consultation meeting, we can respectfully agree to disagree. We believe in this project. We believe in the revitalization of that area. We believe in the densification of that area because of the REM coming into that area that will encourage families without a vehicle to live in an area where they have active and public transport. We believe in, the, in that because that area has been neglected for many years because of probably many reasons. And here we have an opportunity to revitalize and beautify and densify and create mixed use in a community that has somehow been neglected because of probably many reasons, and you know across the street with the Bank Nationale, and you know with the Laurentian Bank that's across, and it's been vacant for Possibly many, many by years. Possibly the borough no, and no. investment. But Mrs. Bond, <laughs> let me finish, please. And I'm saying to you that when a promoter comes forward and has a viable project that makes sense to us, that is presented through a public consultation meeting, that is not only done through this uh, forum, but also through the public consultation, allows for residents to be able to come and oppose or not. And you come here and you tell me that it was purposely done to put two projects together purposely by the borough. For what reason, I have no idea. And then to tell me that many folks that were opposed to it and are opposed to it haven't spoken to us because they could have come and signed the register or to start a register, and they didn't. So we went through all the legal processes and we produced the, 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 the project at a public consultation, allowing for folks like yourself and others to come and present their, you know, you know, if they don't want it or, or if they do. none of the issues have been addressed. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you. the project was looked at not only by, by the services, by the CCU, the recommendations were proposed to us by to, to our council, and our council approved it. So we believe in that, and we stand behind that project, Mrs. Bond, and we welcome other projects like this to come into our community because it'll only strengthen our community, especially in Roxborough, where once upon a time that was the center hub of the West Island, and now we are going to get it back and slowly start rebuilding that area because of the REM. Thank you, Mrs. Bond. 70, 70, Merci beaucoup. Bonne soirée à vous tous. Have a great summer, folks, and we'll see you in August. Merci.